Okay, um, China is going to end 25-year wait. Uh, UN oil futures are going to start trading uh, on uh, March 26th. Now, what effect is this actually going to have on the whole complexion of everything? Uh, a lot of people are out there and they're thinking this will be the demise of the dollar. Bang, this is over. And the stock markets are all going to crash. The world is going to come to an end when you when the yuan oil futures start trading uh, on March 26th. I think this is going to be it. That this is going to be it. Okay. Now I've considered this and I've thought about what it's going to actually really do. What the real effect's going to be. And I'm going to get down to what I think the real effect is going to be when the yuan oil futures start to trade on the 26th of March. I think it is going to have an effect on the dollar, but I don't think the effect is going to be immediate, and I don't think that the effect is going to be profound. Now, here's where it gets tricky. I think that the effect that it's going to have is that it is going to tend to weaken the dollar somewhat, but what's going to negate that effect is when the stock market crash reaches its, what I would call, crescendo point. It's like if you're having a uh, an opera, and the music builds up to a crescendo. Well, the music's going when the music is building up to the crescendo, and then, boom, the crescendo hits. Well, here's the thing about the stock market. it's This crash is going to be a crash that goes like a crescendo. It's going to crash at first, it's going to crash, and it's going to crash, and then it's going to really crash. And the real pressure is going to come in when it really crashes. Now, up until then, what we've been was we've been going through this period of very, very slight inflation. It's not, it's only marginal. I call it marginal inflation. Now, from 2008 up until quite recently, there was very little inflation. We were almost, uh, parts of the economy were deflating even because it was caused by 2008. And even that liquidity that they injected into the system went into a liquidity trap. It didn't make it into the general economy, quantitative easing. Went into a liquidity trap. It was trapped by the banking system. So we were, uh, they were actually fighting moderate deflation. All that money that they created in quantitative easing is actually still sitting there. It's an ocean of money. It's ready to create the hyperinflation. It's all there. It's ready to create the hyper. The hyperinflation, the money, the money printing's already been done for the hyperinflation. But but here's the thing. Now I'm actually getting off the topic a little bit. Is what is the effect of this Chinese? Uh, going ahead with their uh, UN oil futures contracts and on the 26th of March. What's this going to do? This is going to start to weaken the dollar a little bit. So it's inflationary. But the thing is, is it's not going to be a lasting effect because when the crescendo of the stock market crash hits, now I'm going to tell you when the stock, I think the stock market crash is coming, either in April or in August, uh, those are the two months I think it's either coming in. So if we can escape April, and I don't think we're going to, guys. I really don't think we're going to. I think it's coming in April. I feel fairly confident that it's coming in April. The only way we're going to escape April is if somehow, if some miracle, the uh, markets are able to price in uh, that the Fed selling their toxic balance book to $30 billion, and I don't think they can price that in. It's just too much, right? So I think that the market crash, I think that the uh, U.S. 10-year at that point is going to exceed 3 to 3 3.15 or 3.25%, and then we're going to get our big crash, an enormous crash. So it's at the crescendo of this crash that I think is coming in April. When we are going to get the fear is going to enter in. An enormous amount of fear. That fear is going to have a deflationary effect. And there's three places they're going to run to. 
Now think about this for a minute. I want you to think about this for a minute. When they really get frightened and they start to sell, 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 what do they run into? Traders. What do they run into? They run into cash. They run into liquid, liquid asset. So if they sell, they go into cash. Now, if a lot of them are doing this because of fear, they're, and they're all running into cash. What's this going to do? What did it do in 1929 when they all got frightened and they all the stock market went pooey? The dollar went up in value. It went into a deflation. Everybody gets frightened. Everybody hauls their horns and nobody buys anything. And the next thing you know, prices are starting to drop. And we're having a real honest to gosh in deflation, a deflation. This is what comes, deflation. And this is what will come. And when deflation comes, the dollar, this is going to pick up steam for the dollar. This is not going to weaken the dollar. The dollar is going to get stronger. So even with this, even with the, the effect of this market crash, when it really gets severe, is going to counter the effect of what the Chinese are going to do on, on, uh, on March 26th. It's going to counter that because this is, this is going to hurt the dollar. So we got two things coming together here. We got one that is going to come in and it's going to help the dollar. And the other one, this this what's happening on March 26th with these uh, crude futures uh, trading in Yuan, is going to hurt the dollar. So we got two things that oppose each other coming in together at the same time. One that's going to support the dollar, one that's going to destroy the dollar. So to a certain degree... They're like two old people. Say you got a husband and a wife, and she says, I'm voting Democrat, and he says, I'm voting Republican. Well, they cancel each other's votes out. Well, that's what this is going to do to a certain degree. But I think that the deflation is going to overpower the fact that the Chinese are selling oil futures contracts. For a little while. For a little while. But the futures contract thing is going to still stay there underlying the stock market thing. So now we go through this stock market crash and we get our little period of deflation and then the Fed comes in and they change everything around and they go back to quantitative easing and they go back to helicopter money and whatever else they have to do to open the floodgates of money in either uh, April or in August. Because that's when the crash is coming. It's came, uh, I believe it's coming either in April or in August. And the reason why I believe those two months is, is because in April they're raising it $30 billion and they're going to raise it to $40 billion in August. So that's why I think that they're going to keep raising the bar. They're not going to stop. The Feds already say they're, they're thinking three interest rate hikes this year. They're not going to stop until they get the crisis that's going to stop them. The crisis is going to stop them in their tracks. That's when they're going to have to reverse course. So now the Fed, picture we're to the point now where the Fed reverses course on all of this. So say we go through till March, we get our uh, April, we get our crash, and say around the end of April, the Fed reverses course on everything. They go back to, they open up quantitative easing again. They open up the floodgates of money and they try to repair the damage that was done to the stock market. Let's just say the first day the stock market jumps two th over a thousand points. The first day it jumps up after the Fed repairs this thing. You know? What then? That's when this UN oil contract futures really comes into play because it's still going to be in effect. And if anything, it's going to have more of an effect then. You know, that's when gold and silver is really going to shine. So now, I'm going to put up some charts right here. Okay? Why don't you take a look at these charts? Okay, I want to explain these charts. First off, this chart right here shows the 1929 stock market crash in the run-up that took 10 years, roughly 10 years. Uh, all through the 1920s, we had this run-up 
People were buying uh, the stock market, buying into the stock market on margin. They were investing a small amount of money, and they were uh, they were having a tremendous amount of margin that they could buy the stock market, buy in on the stock market. Common ordinary people were buying in the stock market. We had this monstrous run up. Now, if you notice in the charts, the run up that we had looked very similar to the run up that we have today in the last ten years. They're both a ten year run up. Uh, the run up that started in the 1920s was called the Roaring Twenties. That's what they named that decade because of that run-up in the stock market that led to 1929 and the monstrous crash in 1929. Now, in the last 10 years, since 2008 until now, which is 10 years again, we've had a tremendous run-up in the stock market. And ordinary people now are invested in the stock market, and that's very similar to in 1929 when ordinary people was invested in the stock market. Ordinary people get involved. And you get a massively overbought stock market. Just like in 1929, it was massively overbought. Then you get a precipitous fall, a crash, a stock market crash. 1929, they had a precipitous fall and a stock market crash. We're getting ready for that crash. The Fed brought on the crash in 1929. And the Fed's going to bring on this crash. Very much parallels. The 1929 stock market crash. Now, you might want to ask yourself, percentage-wise, what would our stock market fall to if we had an equivalent stock market crash to 1929? Now, 1929 set a precedent. So we got to say, hey, it can happen, and it can be just as severe as 1929. So what would it fall to? Our stock market today, which is at around 25, 26,000, more or less, would fall to 2,800. 2,800 if we have an equivalent crash. Now, our grandparents or great-grandparents or great-grandparents survived the 1929 into the 1930s in what they called the Great Depression that was caused by the stock market crash. It was a deflationary depression. Gold and silver did very good during the deflationary depression that occurred in the, in the, after the stock market crash in 1929. In fact, gold and silver actually outperformed, from what I understand, the dollar. And the dollar performed extremely well. So, we see what you, when you get a deflationary depression or a hyperinflationary depression, Gold and silver is the place to run to. They are going to run to three things initially when they get this crash of the markets. And probably in April. Probably, but it might be in August. It might be three months later. Or, or if the Fed is extremely fortunate, three months after that. The only way that this is going to get any better is if the Fed were to relent. And say, okay, we're not going to sell our toxic balance book anymore. But do you know what? If they if they did that, you know what would happen? They would lose completely, lose all credibility. Nobody would have any faith in the dollar. And because this petro yuan thing is coming in, in the 26th, it would have 10 times the effect that it is going to have, or would have. And we would have our crack up boom right away if they do that. They know it. So they know they got to stay on course, the Fed does. They're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. They either stay on course with this and we get our stock market crash at some point. The Fed's not even sure. They don't know what point we're going to get the stock market crash. The Fed right now is peeing themselves. They know we're going to have a stock market crash, but they don't know when exactly when it's going to. In fact, they might be listening to me tonight to try to get clues as to when this stock market crash is actually coming. You know, because they're frightened and they know that they got to stay on course and they got to cause this crash. They got no alternative because the alternative is we have the crack up boom right away. If they pull the plug on what they're doing, if they say, OK, no more rate hikes and we're going to go back to quantitative easing tomorrow. And oh, by the way, we're going to stop this, this nonsense and shenanigans about trying to sell our toxic balance book. 
They will lose all credibility, all faith in the dollar will be lost tomorrow morning if they do that. And the dollar will crash. It'll crash and burn tomorrow. And so they'll have their crisis tomorrow. They want to prolong this thing as long as they possibly can, the Fed. And they know the only way they can prolong it is by staying the course. But they also know that by staying the course, they're going to induce a stock market crash and the monster of a stock market crash. So either way they turn on this, if they stay the course, they're going to cause a calamity. And if they don't stay the course, they're going to cause an immediate calamity. So which do they want? I'm going to tell you which they want. They want to prolong the calamity. They want to get as far as they can. They say to themselves, hey, you know what? We're going to cause a stock market crash. But we might be able to squeeze out three or four or five months before it happens. And they say to themselves, if we're lucky, we might even get six months or nine months before it happens. And those six months or nine months are better than having the whole thing come down on us tomorrow morning. And they know that if they were to change direction right now, midstream, that all confidence would be lost and this whole system's going to come down tomorrow morning if they do that. They know that. So which do you prefer? If you're a Fed official, which do you prefer? The, the, the market to crash nine months from now? And the Fed might get lucky if they pump in some liquidity into the markets or something like that. Some nonsense or shenanigans is probably what they're thinking to themselves. They're probably thinking to themselves, hey, you know what? If we sit back and we let the market crash happen, say, six months from now, first off, we've bought ourselves six months. And number two, we'll get the plunge protection team out there and we'll pump resources in and we'll we'll modify the crash. This is probably what they're thinking to themselves. They don't know the power of the market when this real crash comes. They don't know. They don't realize the power of the market. They don't realize that the amount of pressure that they've created through leverage over the years this, of all the forced debt creation that they've done is all going to come back to haunt them. It's going to be a monster of a crash. Now, here's the thing. Will it be as bad as the 1929 crash? Will we have that percentage uh, that if we, get, if we obtain the percentage of the 1929 stock market crash, the market will crash down to 2,800? Can you imagine? Under 3,000? Everyone, everyone would lose everything. And maybe in 1929, they were jumping out of windows. That's what they were doing because they lost everything. They lost their home. They lost their car. And, and two days earlier, they had everything. They had the world all through the Roaring Twenties. And you know what they said? When the stock market was going up during the Roaring Twenties, it was up higher and higher and higher. There was forecasters out there saying it will go up forever. It will go up forever. They're saying the same thing today. Same words are coming out of their mouth. That it's going to go forever. It'll never stop. It's going to go to the heavens. The market. And get in it now. Get in it now. Because it's the greatest way to make money. It's going to continue to go up forever. Well, they had this little warning. They had the little warning. That little warning that they just had a week or two ago. That was a tremor. The big volcano is getting ready to blow. That's what it means. That's what that little warning, that little shake of the ground, that's what it means. The big crash is coming, boys. It's coming. And so we got a little bit of time left, though, I think, before. I'm not sure, I'll tell you honestly. I got to be honest with you guys. I'm not sure we really have until April or August. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure we have that much time left. We this could this could possibly turn into a dead cat bounce. I just it's just my feeling that it won't. And I explained my reasoning on that in my in my very last show I did last night. But anyway, compare these charts of the run up from 1929, and compare this run up uh, from uh, 2018, and you'll see market similarities. The way the market has been pushed up 
In the 1920s, it was pushed up by an awful lot of margin buying by a lot of general people out there. Uh, and now the market has been pushed up an awful lot by companies buying shares in their own uh, in their own companies. But they've bought it on debt that's very much similar to the margin debt from the 1920s. It's all, it's been pumped. You ever heard the saying, uh, the, this market here, what we're looking at, is a pumped market. What comes after pump? Pump and, pump and, <laughs> listen, I wouldn't buy into the markets with a 10-foot pole right now. On it. Now, just just me. I'm just talking about me and my money. I wouldn't buy into these markets right now with a 10-foot pole. But I'm going to tell you what. After this crash is over, I believe that we're, we're going to come into a period where the markets are going to do rather well again. So the time to buy in is after the crash is over, after this crash is over. You know, that's the time to buy in. So listen, thank you guys for listening. Like and subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next show. Bye.